Well, good morning. So today I'm going to talk about this sign. <clears throat> Caution. Wet floor. There's a sermon. Have a great day. Thanks for coming. Uh, you know, when do we... So last weekend it was raining on sa- uh, Sunday morning when you got here, and I came in and I did the uh, slight slip, and I thought, you know what, we'll put a couple of these out just to let people know, be careful. As far as I know, nobody fell. And... Uh, uh, this was like a warning of something coming up. Be careful. Look out. Wouldn't it be nice in life before something changed, whatever it was, like you saw this ahead of time? Like you saw this and then you're, and it says on there, next week your boss is going to call you in for a special meeting. <laughs> next week the doctor will call and say, I need to see you right away. Or, like the call I got, and I just want to let you guys know, uh, uh, Ricky and Brooke are sitting here in the front row, and uh, I'm going to be a granddaddy here coming up. They just want to see gray hair on me, that's all that's about. But you know, nobody sends you a sign and says, this is what's happening next. And we go through life so often, and not all news is good news, right? You know, you get that call from the doctor, and they say, come see me. Uh, you get that headache, and you say, and the doctor says, I need, you need an MRI? And you go, yeah, but it's just a headache. And he goes, no, it's not. You know, you have something come up, and you didn't know. And Daniel had dealt with so many <laughs> different rulers I mean, the, the guy was dragged out of his hometown. He was in the nobility as a kid, and he had his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or as Steve calls him, Horshack and Warshack, and I don't know what he calls him. He's just, and Benny, and Benny, Rackshack, and Benny. You know, and, and they, they were dragged out of town, and then, and then they, you know, of course, had the food test, and then uh, his friends had the fiery furnace test, and then... He get, they get threatened to get killed a few different times when they didn't interpret a dream. And now he's like 80-something years old. And all of a sudden they say, if you pray, you're going to go to the lion's den. I mean, it's just craziness. And I don't know about you, but I was thinking, you know, don't you think Daniel was like, uh, God, I, it's time for me to retire. I, I need a little time off. You know, we went on this mission trip this week, and one of the most amazing things to me was Larry, who went with us, is 87 years old. And I said, Larry, don't you need a chair? And he said, no, I'm all right. I'm like, no, no, you need a chair because I can't sit down unless you sit down. Aren't you tired? Don't you want to take a break? Now, Uncle Carl took me up on it when I said it's time to take a break. He's like, okay. Uh, But no, we had to make Larry sit down just so I'd feel better. Right? And, and so the truth about life is as you get older sometimes, you think, well, how did Daniel do all this? And, and what it was, he had three big things in his life. He didn't have warning signs, but he just kept doing what God wanted him to do. And so here's what I want to tell you today. You can't choose what happens to you, but you can choose how you respond. And when we look at Daniel, he responded through integrity, faithfulness, and trusting God. So, so today we're going to. T- this is going to be our subject. How our witness should be like Daniel. And so, when it comes to these unexpected things, so we got up to North Carolina and and we got to our place. And as we came up there, I saw like a little park, and I thought, well, let's walk down to that park. And we walked down a hill, and um, a few of us went together and went down to this park. It was amazing. There was a lake, and you could see the mountains in the background, and you know, the sun was getting ready to set, and we were just looking, oh, it's so beautiful. So we started walking back, and um, the good news is I felt like I was in really good shape, because all I could hear was the people behind me whining about the hill. It was awesome, and I was just walking up the hill, and I'm like, oh, left them behind. And then somebody came by with a dog, and there was a rabbit, and we said, the dog doesn't care about the rabbit? She goes, no, 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 the dog doesn't care about the rabbit because it smells a bear. What? <laughs> Now, you got to realize, I've heard that you have to know what type of bear, what you're supposed to do. And can I tell you that I have no idea which... So I'm thinking, first of all, I've got to identify the bear. Second of all, I've got to identify, am I supposed to lay down? Am I supposed to sit up? Am I supposed to look big? Am I supposed to fight it? Do I put on boxing gloves? What do we do 
but I figured out the only thing I have to do is outrun those people that are down the hill. I was ready, right? A lot of times in life, you don't get a warning sign till right before or during or something happens you don't like. How many people in here, you would say, life has gone exactly like you thought? You're a liar. Okay, right? <laughs> Last night, my team, the University of Miami, decided to lose a game that you shouldn't have lost by not kneeling at the end of the game. You know, every team says, 25 seconds left, just kneel and be done. But for some reason, the coach said, nah, let's run it. Fumble. Oh. Hail Mary. Hail Mary. We lost. It's like watching the Dolphins. And, and so... <laughs> Um, so the good news about the Dolphins every year is they just, every year they do their best to get your hopes up and then dash them to the ground. So you get used to disappointment. So Dolphin fans are used to warning signs. They should know what happens next. So today we're going to look at Daniel and look at how his life changed, but how, how he responded didn't change. And listen, I can't tell you what's next for you. I wish I could. I would love it if I could, you could walk up. And I could just hold your hands and Jesus would tell me, oh, next week they're going to get a bonus at work, you know, or whatever, or bad news or whatever. But that doesn't happen. And the truth is, as we walk through life, we don't always know. But how we respond, specifically how Daniel responded, is an example to us of how to respond. So number one, Daniel had integrity in all things, integrity in all things. Now, this is a big deal, because if you didn't know it, Daniel was a politician that worked with politicians. And so let's hear what happens in the story. We're going to pick up in Daniel chapter 6, verse 3 through 7. Here it is. Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps, by, that's like Congress, and okay, <clears throat> that by his exceptional qualities that the king planned, listen, to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. Time out. So why did they go after him? Because they didn't want him to be their boss. They didn't want him to, to be ahead of them. They didn't like who he was or where he was from or whatever it was, or maybe just the fact that he was an honest person. They're like, how are we going to be able to do stock trading if he outlaws it? We won't be able to do it anymore and be billionaires by the time we leave Congress. How, sorry, that's a pet peeve of mine. How is that going to happen? And so what they do, they said, we've got to figure out what Daniel does wrong. We've got to find some dirt on this guy. Now listen, the next part is amazing. They were unable to do so. And then it says this, they could find no corruption. And this word for corruption means rot. Now it didn't mean that Daniel was perfect, but it meant that he did things right. No corruption in him. Listen, he was trustworthy and he was neither corrupt or negligent. And what they mean is he wasn't just napping all day. So he wasn't it wasn't only that he wasn't corrupt, he wasn't taking bribes, but he also did his job. And so they couldn't find anything wrong with him. He was faithful. So what'd they do? Finally, these men said, we'll never find any basis of charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. I'm glad people don't greet other people that way. That's such an odd, right? The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed the king should issue a verdict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. So what they do? They said, we can't get him in trouble for something illegal. What can we try him for? Oh, worshiping God. So let me ask this question. If somebody wanted to convict you of worshiping God, would they be able to prove it? If somebody looked at your life and was going to say, we got to get something on this person, what do you got on them? Oh yeah, they pray. A lot. Would we 
be the ones that got into trouble. Listen to what it says in 1 Peter 3.16. A few verses earlier, it says, basically, as Christians, we need to honor Christ as Lord. And then it says this, keeping a clear conscience. Why? So that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So here's the question about this. Is there any area in your life that you need to repent about? Is there any area where even if a person who wasn't a Christian looked at you, they'd be like, gosh, they are sinning. <laughs> they are pursuing things they shouldn't pursue. See, when they looked at Daniel, they could find no corruption. And the truth for us is, as Christians, can I tell you one of the secrets of being a good Christian? Is to recognize that you need grace. That when somebody says something to you like, you're a Christian you, you've got everything together, right? That you almost fall out of your chair if they say those words. Like, what? One of the things as a believer that we need to understand is how much we all need God's grace. And so that when somebody looks at your life, maybe they don't find perfection, but what they do find is humility. What they do find is somebody who says, you know what? I need Jesus every day. I can't walk Anywhere. I can't go to Walmart and be a Christian. I can't, definitely can't drive on I-95 and love Jesus. Right? I, I need the Holy Spirit all the time. And I need God's grace when I mess up. And the truth is, all of us every day should take some time. Every day. To say, God, is there anything in my life where my conscience is not clear? God, is there anything I need to repent of? And the word repentance is a complicated word, but it really just means turning around. Saying, this is wrong. And so, God, forgive me for doing this wrong thing. And would you help me to overcome it? You know, maybe your problem is the things that you say. Maybe your problem is the things that you think. Maybe your problem is the things that you look at. Maybe it's time to fast from TV. Maybe it's time to fast from the Internet. Or like Rodney was saying earlier, maybe it's time to fast from the news or from Facebook, whatever. But to take some time every day to say, God, create in me a pure heart. Is there any area of my life that I need to make right with you? And if we do that, what tends to happen is God begins to work on us and continues to work on us. Most of us have a specific thing that we struggle with all the time. But the truth is that God will even point out things to you like habits and ways of thinking or even pride that sneak in. That when we're humble and we humble ourselves and confess it to him, he begins to change us. Number two. So not only integrity in all things, he was faithful in all circumstances. Faithfulness in all circumstances. So when I was young, I'll never forget this. A guy came to our church who was a uh, developer. And this was back uh, early 70s. They had just started doing big developments and down in Miami. And uh, this guy was a developer. And he came and he realized that at our church there were a lot of contractors and subcontractors there were plumbers and electricians and all kind of people so he came into the church and basically drafted all these people and said hey and my dad was a general contractor so he said hey you've got about 20 or 30 homes I asked my mom how many she said yeah around 20 or 30 and so he about 20 or 30 homes and so my dad was the general contractor which meant that he hired subcontractors to finish the homes if you don't know how that works for a developer and the developer pays the contractor and then the contractor paid the subs I don't know if that's how it works now but that's how it worked then and so my dad got started on all these homes 20 or 30 homes down in Miami and he hired the subs so he not only my dad did things like lay the block and get everything ready uh, we dug a lot of ditches I remember that part people say why don't you like country music you like bluegrass because I can remember he stopped loving her today they laid a wreath upon his door, and soon they'll carry him away. They stopped loving her today. You guys like that song, don't you? But anyway, that was my childhood. I was so excited when the Oak Ridge Boys came up. Elvira, uh, uh, uh. Anyway, yeah, country music makes me do this. That's just what I do. So, so we were digging the ditches, we did the thing, and then he would hire. So you'd have, a, you'd have a, somebody come in and do the, the, uh, the trusses, bring the trusses in. 
Uh, you'd have somebody else come in and do the plumbing. You'd have an electrician come in and do the electric. So, you know, you hired those guys ahead of time. They had to go buy supplies and everything to get ready. So my dad hired all those guys. This guy that was at our church went, took his draw from the bank, is what it was called back then, and he took a big draw from the bank. And instead of paying the contractors, he then claimed bankruptcy and left town. Left all the contractors without their money, which left all the subcontractors. A bunch of those guys went out of business because they couldn't afford all the stuff that they had bought. Now, my dad did something that showed his faithfulness. He went, and I'll never forget, he talked to my mom about this, and they went into their personal bank account and paid every single sub. Now, my dad did not have everything together in life. But I can tell you that he was an honest man, and he had promised these guys he would pay them, and he said, no matter what, I'm going to pay these guys. And he paid every one of his subcontractors, even though somebody else ripped him off. And see, that's what you see in Daniel, somebody who was faithful, not somebody who was perfect, but somebody that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what changed around them, he just continued to say, God, what do you want me to do? And so that's where we pick up the story once again now in verse uh, 10, and then we'll skip to verse 14 to get the rest of the story. Now, when Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where his windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God. Now, listen to this. Just as he had done before. He didn't change his habits. He didn't go out in the street to pray. He didn't change how he prayed. What did he do? He opened his window to heaven to pray, like he, or excuse me, to Jerusalem to pray like he always had done. By the way, if you remember, as a child, he saw the temple going from the place where worship took place, where sacrifice took place, a reminder of the Messiah to come to a place that was destroyed. And he opened his doors to remind him of all those things when he prayed. And so just as he had done before, he chose, I'm going to obey God over the government. Now, the Bible is very clear that there are times that we, we should obey those in authority unless they begin to violate what God wants us to do. And that's what happens here. And then it continues. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. Now, the king finds out that Daniel is praying, even though he had told him not to. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember your majesty. They didn't say live forever, by the way, at this one time, right? Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issued can be changed. By the way, the king knew that. They were belittling the king. By the, you're gonna, at the end of the story, it's, let me just say it's not a good thing. So the story continues. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him in the lion's den. Eighty-something years old, dropped into a lion's den. There are, listen, I don't want to take an 80 year old in here and push them. I don't want to, I want to help an 80 year old. Don't you think Daniel, like part of his prayer was like, God, it's time for me to take a break. Just a little retirement. Couldn't I just leave town, go tour the sites? But no, he was still faithful doing what God called him to do, including praying. And he was thrown into a lion's den. And scholars love that don't believe the Bible love to say, well, Daniel must have hidden in a crevice. That's the reason the lions didn't get to him, really. 80-year-old, what is he, sprinting over to the side? He played dodgeball all night with the... Have you played dodgeball with an 80-year-old lately? Come on now, all right? Threw him in the lion's den. The king said to Daniel... May the God whom you serve continually rescue you. Why? Because Daniel was such an example that even the king noticed that worship was a part of his life. That's how faithful he was. And Daniel said uh, he was faithful every day. When this edict was passed, he was faithful then. Even though the situation had changed, Daniel continued to be who he always was. Are you that way? Are you the same person under trial that you are when things are easy? Do you have the, the same desire to know God and worship God when things are easy and when things are hard? Daniel was the same 
all the time. Now, I'll be honest with you. I can't imagine being Daniel, and all of a sudden you find out that this edict is passed. And of course, you're thinking, the king must hate my guts. He knows I pray, which the king didn't, right? And I don't know if you've ever had something happen or a change or a decision you had to make where you wake up in the middle of the night. You ever had that one? You ever wake up in the middle of the night and you're dreaming worry? And you wake up... And you wake up worried, and then you can't sleep. How many of you have ever done that? Come on now. Thank you. Thanks for lying. All right. Right? Everybody does that, right? I hope everybody. If you don't, let me know. I want to know your secret. If it's Xanax, that doesn't count. Right? <laughs> Benadryl. Okay. Anyway. So, so, right? So you wake up in the middle of the night, you're worried. What do you do? Can, can I tell you three things that I do? Would that be okay with you? Number one. I imagine whatever the struggle is. Sometimes it's with people. Sometimes it's with a situation. Sometimes it's just something I worry about. Hey, I've, I've woken up in the middle of the night, didn't think I was worried about anything. But boy, in the middle of the night, they sneak up on you, don't they? There's a bear. The dog smells it. <laughs> right? So you wake up, you're freaked out. So what do you do? I imagine myself taking whatever that is and saying, God, can you take care of this? God, can you deal with this? Can you handle it? Now, let me tell you a second thing I do. And the second and third thing involve the same thing. I start to give thanks to God. And one of the ways I do it, because I'm so ADD, I lose my train of thought. You ever lose your train of thought when you're praying? You're like, dear Jesus, would you help my friend today as they deal with this situation? I wonder if I've got the groceries on the stove. I think I forgot that, right? You ever do that when you're praying? So what I do is I use the alphabet. And I learned this years ago from Peter Lord. I use the alphabet. And so, and so uh, just, just I think of things to be thankful for that go along with the I've given thanks for apples many, many times because that's the first thing. But anything with an A, you know. And then bananas. I've given thanks for a lot of bananas. You know. But it doesn't have to be apples or bananas. It could be whatever you think of. And, you just, and just go through that. Lord, I thank you for Christ. Lord, I thank you for deliverance. Lord, I thank you for eternity. You get the idea? And just go through the alphabet. Now. Here's the, here's the next one, and you'll like this one. I not only thank God, but I pray for people as I go through the alphabet. Xavier's been prayed for so many times because there's only one X name I know. Right? right? And so what do you do? You, Lord, thank you for my friend Andrew. I pray that you'd bless him. And just go through the alphabet and pray for your friends and thank God for the people you know. What does that do? That refocuses you away from your worry. By the way, worry is a type of worship. It means you think you're in control. How are you doing on controlling life, by the way? You doing well? So when you wake up worried, I want to encourage you. Do those things. Give time to be thankful. Let me give you a fourth one. Here's another one that I've started doing recently because I'm getting old. When I start to worry, I look back and I start in high school and I think of the things that God has brought me through and I thank him for that. You know that one girl you dated that you're so glad you thought you were going to marry her and you're like. And then they show up on Facebook and you go. Right. Right. Then I go through college and see how God's seen me through and I go through right. And I look back and I see how God has seen me through. And guess what? I began refocusing, going from worrying and worshiping that worry and what I think I'm going to fix it to, God, you're in charge. You've always been in charge. You're going to be in charge tomorrow. And whether I end up in the lion's den or not, you're going to take care of me. One way or the other. If it's not on this earth, it'll be in the next. One way or the other, I'm going to be all right. 1 Corinthians 4, 2. Now it is required that those who've been given a trust, listen to this, prove faithful. You can only tell if you're being faithful when you go through a trial. When everything's good, we all sound spiritual. God just been so good to me. I just, oh, I'm so blessed every day. You get a flat tire? <laughs> We were on our trip. I got a split tire in the front tire. We were at the 
children's home about a half hour from the airport. I called budget. They said, would you drive it over here? <laughs> drive it? So I got one of our guys. I said, look at that tire. I said, you think I can make it to the airport? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. I go, how about home? He goes, oh, no, 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 don't drive that far. And then as I was driving over there, he calls me. Are you okay? What, what do you mean am I okay? Your tire's okay, right? And I'm like, you lied to me to get me to go over here? When there's something to worry about, sometimes we go from worshiping God and being faithful to not. And you know what? That's normal. That's human nature. And then you just have to go back to God, I need you. We visited with two of my friends. One had a stroke and can't walk right now. He's frustrated. Wouldn't you be frustrated? He's used to being able to do what he wants. He can't. Another one of my friends we visited with has Lou Gehrig's disease. Just found out a few months ago. In the last couple of weeks, she lost the ability to talk. So she was texting everybody and messaging everybody and telling them about life. She said she gets frustrated some days. Don't you? When you walk through difficult things, how are you going to respond? Are you going to be faithful and say, God, I'm going to trust you? By the way, you don't have to say, God, thank you. I just love this. But you can say, God, thank you that you're going to walk me through this. Sometimes we just need to repent of not being able to surrender. The Christian life's all about surrender. And you know what that means? I don't have control. I don't know about you. I like control. Have you seen me drive? You've seen me drive. But, right? I like control. I only ran one person off the road. Number three. It wasn't on purpose. Trusting God at all times. My favorite story was about this children's home. The pastor knew they were taking care of orphans. And he knew he needed to do something. There was no orphanage in the mountains in North Carolina. And he knew he had to do something. So he's praying about, God, what do I do? It's going to cost a lot of money. And we've got to get property. And we've got to build a building. And we've got to figure all this out. This is about 100 years ago. So he began praying about it. And he said, well, I don't know what to do. And, and he shared about what he was going to do. And a little girl who had 13 pennies in her pocket came up and put those pennies in his hand and said, here's a start. And so if you go to that place today, their brand new cafe is called the 13 Pennies Cafe. To remind them that God started and always starts with something small. And he's always faithful. And when life gets hard and you didn't get the sign that things are going to go wrong, you can trust him. By the way, one of my favorite things to pray is, God, I don't understand, but I trust you. And as a pastor, I've prayed that a thousand times. Because can I tell you a secret that you may not know? God doesn't always answer my prayers the way I want him to. I've prayed for people and seen God do miraculous things. And I've prayed for people and it doesn't happen the way I thought it would happen. But God's always faithful. Let's read the rest. Here we go. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished Voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And I wonder at this point, you know, we don't know what happened during the night. It says the angel held the mouths of the lions closed. Was Daniel tired? I mean, he was 80 years old. He might have had his head on a couple of lions, you know, a little paw, just a little paw, just snuggling with the paw. It's like a big cat, right? Can you imagine a big old fat cat? Just, well, they were kind of skinny then they'd start. But anyway, you know, just... I wonder if Daniel heard the king and thought, I'm going to pause for just a second. <laughs> Daniel, has your God saved you? One, one thousand. <laughs> now, Daniel learned a little something from the other guys. Listen to what he says next. May the king live forever. Seemed to work for the other guys, so he's going with it. My God sent his angel. He shut the mouths of the lion. They've not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Now, listen to this. This is a lesson for you and me about when somebody accuses you falsely. When you get accused falsely, it's okay to say, I didn't do anything wrong. And that's what he says here. Listen to what he says. Because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. Which, by the way, the king knew that anyway, you know. But Daniel made sure to plead his case for just a moment. 
The king was overjoyed, gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den, and when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, and I wonder if he was well rested. Because he had trusted in his God, and you know what happens next. The king goes and gets the families of the other guys and drops them in, and those guys are eaten before they hit the ground. There was no good Dodge Lions game going on that day. Daniel did not trust himself. It says here, he trusted in God. See, worry is when we trust ourselves. When we trust ourselves, we wear ourselves out. But can I tell you, you are not trustworthy. You know how I know that? Because I'm not trustworthy. You know how I know that? Because if Michelle brings barbecue potato chips to church and hands them to me and says, take these home to your family, that's funny. That's just mean. They won't make it home. Because I love barbecue potato chips. And I love barbecue potato chips that even if I made a vow, I will not eat barbecue potato chips, barbecue potato chips will show up in my car one way or the other. And I better give these away or they're going to, I'll give them to you, Ricky, you can eat them. Because I know me. And I, I don't resist barbecue potato chips. So guess what? When I go to the grocery store, I don't buy barbecue potato chips. Because if I buy barbecue potato chips, that's the thing that when you're loading the groceries, you see and you grab them out and carry them to the front of the car. And you get home and your wife goes, why do you smell like barbecue potato chips? No idea. <laughs> I can't trust myself. And the truth is, we try to trust ourselves to overcome so many things that if we're honest, we say, God, I trust you. I know I can't trust me. And sometimes, regardless of what's going on in your life, the best thing you can do is surrender it to God. Surrender your situation. Surrender that problem. When that thing comes into your life that you didn't expect, that doctor calls, that situation happens, that person you're dealing with and you don't know what to do, you say, God, I don't know what to do, but I surrender it to you. And then, listen, God, would you guide me? God, would you show me what to do next? Would you show me, would you, would you give me your peace so that I can think straight, so that I can act the way you want me to act, even in the middle of this thing I don't like? Daniel did that. You don't hear Daniel screaming as he headed to the lion's den. You don't see him freaking out. He's got to be like, I'm 80 years old. I mean, this is like the fourth king. What's the deal? And yet he just wakes up in the morning. King, I trusted God. Can you trust him? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, a great one to put on your dash. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I just looked at these potato chips again. I'm so sorry. I got distracted. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him or surrender to him. Acknowledge him, it says in some of the words. The idea of, God, I, I'm looking to you, and he will make your path straight. Corrie Ten Boone, during World War II, was taken to a concentration camp with her family, not because of who they were, but because they hid Jews from the Germans. They were taken to a concentration camp. Instantly, her parents were taken directly to the gas chamber. She was in the concentration camp with her sister for several years. Her sister died, and right after her sister died, Corrie Ten Boone was released by a clerical error. After World War II, Corey Ten Boom went back to Germany to teach, you ready for this, on forgiveness. This week, one of my friends is going to court. His son was killed by another person. And my friend posted online, the most important thing I can do is forgive him. He knows that the guy needs to go to jail. He knows that the guy needs to be away from society, but he said, I'm also learning how to forgive the guy who killed my son. Corey Ten Boone said this quote, There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. When I hear my friend Troy talk about forgiving the person that killed his 20-something-year-old son, God, there's no pit 
where your love's not deeper still. You can't choose what happens to you, but you can choose how you respond. Can we have integrity? Can we have faithfulness? Can we trust God? If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to surrender your life to him. To know that Jesus died. Why? Because we're messed up. We're broken. Somebody had to pay for our sins. And when we surrender our lives to him, the Bible says that he takes our sin and gives us his righteousness. I'd love to pray with you after the service if you want to give your life to Christ today. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian and the truth is worry has been on the top of your list. I hope that today, before you leave here, God would begin to lift your burdens. And know that you don't have to do them alone. There's other people that will pray for you and help you carry the burdens that you have right now. Would you join me as we close in prayer? Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you that you love us so much. Father, I know we have some folks here who even now are going through the lion den. They're going through just a hard time, a struggle. Lord, it seems like they're surrounded by so many things that are so difficult. Lord, would you give your grace to those who are struggling today? Father, I pray even as we finish out our service today, as they hear this song of praise, that their eyes would be turned towards you and you would give them the strength they need. In Jesus' name, amen.